Okay, let's continue. We are going to go through <coughs> these um, paradigms. And as I said, I'm going to give you a short introduction. We're not going to dig very, very deep into this. These are discussed in... Uh, I, uh, I handed out the first chapter of this book to you. This is in Norwegian, but uh, it's in front now, I think. First chapter of Lesha. And also the first chapter of this book, Sport, Culture and Society, which is in English. It's also in front now. And this uh, discusses also these theoretical frameworks or approaches which analyzes sports somehow. And the reason why we go through this now is, of course, as I said, to see how, how we may analyze sport as part of our society. And there are different ways of doing it, but these are some of them. First of all, functionalism. Structural functionalism or functionalism, only functionalism. Functionalism is, as it says here, a framework for building theory that sees society as a complex system whose parts work together to promote solidarity and stability. Functionalism sees society as a mechanism or um, as a system. They use the metaphor of the body. So if you see society as a body, and all parts of the body needs to work in order for the body to be healthy and well functioning. Yeah? So functionalism sees all these social institutions and, and, um, and uh, <coughs> studies how these social institution works to create this stability in society. Um, You don't have to remember this, <laughs> but the founding fathers are two of the mo very prominent and early thinkers in sociology, Comte and Durkheim. Which is, uh, so we see that sociology is, as a subject is developing uh, 200 years ago, probably two, 300 years ago. Um, so functionalism, look at these ins institutions, functions. So that's an easy link, right? So if you think functions, and then you think of the metaphor, the body, the healthy body. You see that functionalists uh, would argue that in order for, for society to work, there needs to be stability, no conflict, there needs to be order, and people need to have what they call a moral consensus. What is that? What would you think moral consensus is? If you read it, you may know it. A moral consensus is that people in the same society or in the same institution share the same values, the moral values. If we relate to this, uh, this to sport, on the sports court, in basketball, all the players in a team and the opposing team know the rules. In order for basketball to be a fair, um, stable game, Everybody needs to play by the rules. So we need stability in order for that particular social structure to function. <coughs> These uh, sociologists see at the, at the macro system. They're talking about this, the, um, the society as a whole, the big structures of society. But you can apply this in the smaller structures as well, such as sport that we just did. We need to share that in order for, st uh, for society to be, to be stable because that, to them, is the aim. A stable society. A healthy body where everything works according to each other. Harmonious, to say it like that. <coughs> for sports organizations, the, they would say, the, uh, Functionalists would say that for sports organizations, the aim must be to create no stir. All parts of, of organization needs to work in order for it to function as good as it can. Yeah? If there is conflict, it won't be optimal. The same in this classroom. 
If there is conflict in this classroom, if you don't talk to each other, if there are conflicts, it's going to be difficult to work together as a group, yeah, in a collective society. <coughs> so when we talk about sport, as this um, article in your book says also, if you talk about sport, in relation to sport, so uh, the functionalist would say that sport um, has socio-emotional functions. In order to do sports, or when you do sports, it can create stability of the mind, basically, or the body. So sports can contribute to society in that sense. You get that? To create stability. Sports as a socialization function. How is sports socialization? We already talked a little bit about it. How do we socialize people? What is socialization in sport? <laughs> yes. You compete with or against other people. You have the same, in the competition, you have the same consensus of what the rules are, yeah? Uh, and so, and then, and then uh, sport can be uh, socializing. Integration of other groups, as you say. The easiest example is immigrants, for instance, a way to include, or women. Everybody should participate in sports, and sports has a socialization function. Then they talk about the integrative funcio function, which is very much related to that, socialization and integra integration. Political um, function, as we talked about earlier, sport has po can serve political purposes. We can use, can use sport for other reasons than that, and so on and so on. So when analyzing sport, we will look at how sport may function in society and uh, is most, uh, in order to be most more stable, stable. That would just, uh, the functionalist would say. But of course, there are people opposing this view, and we will come to that later. This is one way of analyzing sports or society. <coughs> Do you remember Tour de France 2007? French people might remember and the German. Norwegians, we are interested in Tour de France too. This particular Tour de France is known for, maybe more than the results, it's known for, for uh, many incidents of doping. This Tour de France, there were many big teams uh, that were caught doping. T-Mobile, Astana, for instance, Codifis, big uh, teams that were leading uh, in, the, in cycling and they were caught doping. German television, two, two German television channels opposed this. They pulled out. We don't want to cover this. This is not uh, what we want to be related to. Uh, this, and this was a huge scandal. Uh, <coughs> in a functionalist analysis, this would show that this whole competition, that particular year, it was, um, there was disorder. People didn't follow the consensus, the rules. Uh, they broke norms, and probably still do, but they broke norms, and it stirred the whole institution. Uh, as it says here, it can lead to a dissolution of society or a disintegration. We stop to believe in this competition. It's not, it's not uh, functioning. And the consequence can be that one loses faith in the whole competition, unless there is some organization that they actually try to, to clean this. 
so uh, a function list would analyze it like that. This is not how it's supposed to be, and everybody else would agree that this is not how it's supposed to be. But from a function list uh, perspective, uh, this is uh, a dissolution or disorder of the actual competition. So let's go on to another. Have you heard about symbolic interactionism before? No? <coughs> Whereas um, functionalism, look at the big structure, the macro structure. Symbolic interactionism, look at the micro structure, the individual. And this is a, a perspective that is well known from social psychology as well as sociology and other social sciences. And it's a study of individuals' everyday life, basically, and how individuals um, operate as uh, individuals or operate as objects or subjects, sorry. In this uh, uh, theoretical paradigm or whatever, they talk of the social construction of the self, the way the self constructs itself. Thus, it opposes. Uh, you know this debate about heritage um, environment, art of milieu, yeah? This, you, you know this, right? There is the na natural sciences would say that the way you become is destined by your genes or your, uh, your heritage. Whereas social scientists would say, of course, people might not say it's only one thing, but mostly. Whereas social scientists would say, okay, the way you become, okay, you have some, some uh, gene material that would affect who you become, obviously, but it's also created by environment. Who you are is where you grow up, et cetera, et cetera. And these things are, these are the core of many discussions, so we won't move into that. But in um, sociology, they would say that the way you construct yourself is from watching how other people view you. How you interact with other, how you communicate with other, tells you something about who you are. So as it says here, at the same time that people are active subjects, you're observing, you are an observing object. You're also observing how people think about you. And uh, the way you interpret this decides who you are, who you become. Can you relate to this? Yeah, more or less? Not 100% probably. They use the metaphor life as a theater scene. You're always sort of exposed and, and the way you look at yourself is how you're viewed through other people's eyes, basically. But then they also have the use of word, um, the significant others. Have you heard that phrase or that word before? The significant others. Because how you view yourself is not always um, part of your creation of identity. If, hypothetically, if I saw myself through your eyes and you weren't important to me, I wouldn't care, you know? So you, you view yourself through some people's eyes and, okay, that person doesn't make that much sense to me or he's not that important to me. So it doesn't do anything in, in my creation of how I look at myself. You understand that distinction? So the way you place your so-called significant others or what's important to your so-called significant others is also thus important to you. You follow me? Is it complicated? A little bit. Um, to use an example <coughs> from sport, um, if, um, if an athlete no, if if uh, because it's easy to take all those elite athletes and say, okay, they are in, they are 
influenced by how the media looks at them or how the audience looked at them, how, what is written about them, etc., etc. We know that many elite athletes don't read media articles when they're in competition, for instance, because that will do something with how you view yourself. But let's take it on a, on a lo lower level, on the football court Does it, or, or handball, whatever. Does anybody work as coaches here? Yeah? For children? Children or youth? So have a, a group of children in, the, in, the, in a game. And then you have very, very eager and interested parents on the side, on the sideline. The way parents communicate to their children, or even the coaches communicate to the children, will do something with how they perceive their own, um, what do you say, performance in the game. To say it, to make it, to make an easy example. So how how the feedback they get does something with the how they how they perform, and in that case, it might be very important to them to be good, for instance, in football. If you get that feedback, which is not, which is telling you how you're doing it, that will create your understanding of yourself. <laughs> Are you following me? Yeah. <coughs> so in sport, this is relevant on a micro level, very often with individuals. As sports leader and managers, you, some of you, will be in organization, in clubs, etc., where you will be leaders. Some of you have to be, or, or most of you who are going to have other leaders as well. But how you view the people around you will do something with how they view themselves. So this whole idea of symbolic interactionism is actually quite important also in organizations. It's about how we stage each other and how we, and how we uh, communicate, basically. And then it's also this idea, but I, w I won't go very deep into that, but I try to show it here. What is meaningful to me? Um, the thing that makes meaningful meaning for me or is more important to me obviously does more to me than things that are a bit further out in the periphery. So those that are closest to me or I consider as closest to me, they influence me more. Okay. That's one way of analyzing sport. <coughs> Opposing this, the previous theory that we talked about, the functionalism, there is a totally different, um, we might say, uh, approach or paradigm, which is conflict theories. And conflict theories are inspired by, these are well-known names for you, I think, Karl Marx, Marx Weber, theorists that say that everything is power. Everything is powerful. Everything is a power struggle. So there is no such thing as an equal society, a functional, a functional society where everything works like the body is an illusion. That doesn't happen. Everything is in chaos, basically, they would say. Society is built up by structures that is conflict. Um, so these conflict theories, they analyze those inequalities and, uh, and those power differences that they talk about, uh, how they are created, and even more so how they are sustained how they keep on being power structures. Although, for instance, we know that um, in our society, or in Norwegian society at least, we're more or less, we have a dem democratic society, it's more or less a flat structure. <laughs> you understand what I mean? Most people can take education, most people can get more or less, um, of course, not everyone can get wherever they want, but most people can yeah, you can, uh, you can uh, improve or um, move up in politics, society. Most places you can actually do something if you really, really, really want. It requires, of course, a lot of work. But even in a flat system like ours, there are power uh, structures. And there are some, uh, some uh, power differences that are sustained all along. Although you move up, there are still 
power clinches. And the conflict theories, they use the metaphor of the sea. The sea has many different uh, levels. There are currents, there are undercurrents. It looks very still and nice, but there are undercurrents. It's shallow, it's super deep. You have all these differences, and it has to be like that. Society is like that. It's not a well-functioning body. It's just a, a lot of <laughs> mess, basically. But that is how society works and sustains itself, will they say. They will, of course, would, of course, want things to maybe improve or not be as power power written. But still, that is how society is built up. <laughs> and if we analyze sports in relation to conflict theories, um, there are a number of examples. Give me some examples. Obvious one, gender. Gender differences in sport. Why is there so many women in, uh, in a voluntary sports organizations, so many women coaching uh, teams at low levels, and then it's probably more or less equal, and then when it comes to high-level sports, referees and sport leaders, they're al almost only men. Why are there so few women in this classroom, for instance? choosing sport management. And that's a typical question for a power or a conflict theorist. Why are, why are these structures sustained? What is happening? Um, and there are many more of those uh, obvious ways of analyzing sports from a power, uh, power or conflict theory perspectives, perspective. This theoretical perspective is one of those four that I mentioned, which, are, which is also a, quite a large paradigm. And you will learn a lot more about this later when you have game theory, because game theory is a part of this rational choice theories, which means that um, this theoretical direction is, is influenced by finances and economic. Basically, to say it simple, uh, it's a way to understand social and econ economic behavior, why people choose the way they do. And the outset is that people choose, uh, most people um, use these kind of utilitarian principles, meaning that you want to maximize happiness for man as many people as possible. For your own sake, you want to get as, to say that you get a, want to get as much as possible from as little as possible. You rationalize your actions in order to get the maximum of profit from as little as you can. See, the, pro the, the change, no, not the change, they said the chain. Uh, so they, rational choice theorists, they look at people's choices, organizations' choices, uh, and decision making in order to, to um, to analyze how choices and decisions are make, made. For sports organizations, for instance, uh, we, uh, we know they are rationalized. That was part of you guys' exam, for it, some of you guys' exam. So we know that sports organizations are rationalized somehow. But the constant attempt to rationalize even more, to be even more effective, according or uh, not according, but um, more effective, relating to what you put in, your stakes. That is, um, that is how organizations, including sports organizations, tend to continue rationalizing. So analysts in rational choice, uh, um, yeah, rational choice, choice theorists will look at how these, how these choices are made and why are they made. I made a little overview here, and you can dis and you can um, look at this yourself. Uh, but these are some of the like the keywords under which these um, theoretical um, theoretical paradigms are. If um, I have yet to fi finalize the the coursework. Uh, or the essay that you're going to make. 
but uh, I will probably ask you to analyze something from a theoretical uh, paradigm. So just um, just be, be, be prepared. Uh, you're going to be able to use it, of course. But uh, the way, sort of just to, to shift your head in order to analyze from a, from a theoretical perspective is important for us. So we won't go through that now. I think we'll skip this because uh, I want a whole hour for that film. But this is also an assignment that you can do on your own. Um, take all these different things that we've been talking about now, and then you um, write examples of relevant topics or questions that these people might ask. We already touched upon much of it. But it's just a way for you to remember and understand what these theories <coughs> are really about and what they're interested in, or what they might be interested in, in relation to sport. <coughs> Cooper and Simansky, they have an interesting book um, called Soccernomics. These are economics people. And um, I don't know if you read this article that I, um, that I uh, handed out to you in front there. But they have this uh, interesting uh, chapter where they explain or try to explain why poor countries are poor at sports. And then from the starting point, they use this myth that the best preparation for sporting greatness is a poor childhood. And I'm sure that you know many examples of particularly football players from poor childhoods that reach um, the top. And many of these are explained, uh, the explanation is that, that they're so hungry. Many, uh, many, even coaches say that when they get, for instance, African players to their teams, they have this hunger, uh, which is, um, which is um, not, uh, not common for Norwegian players. That might be true. But in uh, a general term, uh, the poor countries, if we <laughs> call it the poor countries, that's also very general, but we're talking generally here. The poor countries are poorer than s in sports than the other countries. And these uh, uh, two researchers, they are um, using a method, of course a discussable one, but they use, they take all sports in the world, or not all sports, many sports in the world, big sports in the world, including Olympics, and they look at which nations are on paper, the best in sport. So they get this list. US is definitely, uh, they, they're counting in medals. You have to read this in order to understand the methodology, and I want to explain it to you now. But they get this list of 20 countries which are the best in sport in the world. US are quite sovereign, and then they actually excluded American football and uh, NASCAR, which is huge. That is, ex is ex excluded from the list, but they are still the best country in sport in the world. This is from 2008. Um, but then they do something else. They, too, they take um, per capita, because in America, there are so many. So they use the same list and take per capita. They divide it. And whom? who did they get in top? Norway and Sweden, the Scandinavian countries. And then they try to explain why this is. I'm not showing you this to brag and say that Norway is so good at sports. Uh, that's not the point here. But the point is to see the explanation or their analysis. Why is this? Why do they say this? Or why can they claim this? Well, first of all, to be successful in sport as a country, wealth. You need to have money. You need a wealthy country to be good at sports. That's the number one. The nation is well, well fed, fed. And then a well-developed sport politics system. Good sport politics. We know that from sport history. 
that Norway has gone a long way from nothing to a well-developed sport policy. <coughs> and that's one of the requirements to be successful in sports as a country. We can always discuss how successful Norway is in sport. And I know that many of you think that they probably aren't that successful. But like on a general, <laughs> general basis, this is required in order to achieve uh, success internationally. And the last one, and this is probably the reason why I show you, because this is sports organization management, and we're going to talk about the Nordic sports model and all that. The well-functioning organization, an organization that takes care of sports in a good and well-functioning way is central <coughs> in order to have sporting success. And that's those things and those criteria that Norway and Sweden, Norway has. As they say, in Norway we have this policy saying that everybody, no matter where you live in the country, you should have the opportunity to do sports. If you're a fisherman, if you are uh, living in the middle of a city or at the remotest part of the, uh, of the country, you should have the opportunity. So we have to build facilities, and some of them are crap, but we, we have to build facilities. We have to do this and that in order to get that, because that's part of our policy. And that's a success factor. <coughs> and then they use the example from South Africa. And obviously, if you remember from the last list, South Africa was one, the only African country that was represented on that list of 20 most successful. And they also make a point out of that those sports that South Africa are represented in, this is before the World Cup, by the way. Those sports that South Africa are represented in are sports that are mainly played by the white majority, no, a minority in South Africa. And we know that the white people in South Africa uh, are also uh, the most wealthy ones. So basically, of course, generalizing, but, um, but uh, they're using South Africa as an example to show why poor nations might, f might fail. And we can also discuss if South Africa is a poor nation, but we won't do that here. First of all, they use the um, argument of malnutrition. You are what you eat. In many poor countries, and it's not just a myth, but children are, if not, of course children are hungrier <laughs> than other children, but it's also got to do with malnutrition. You eat, but you don't necessarily eat uh, the right things. You have a very, uh, or you don't have a balanced, um, what is it called? Costal. Nutrition. nutrition, yeah, balanced nutrition. So they're malnourished. And if you don't, uh, if you are malnourished, you're easier, more easy, easily <laughs> ill. And if you're ill, you don't grow. And if you're malnourished, you don't grow as you would if you were nourished. So this is one easy, yet very sad re uh, reality. Uh, why poor countries might not have that pool of people that are ready to or compete at the same level. Then you have disease. South Africa, 2008, it's still a big problem, although it might not, or it might go a little bit back. HIV AIDS, for instance, they said from a pool of 10, what did they say, 10 players? Or was it less? It's quite possible that a fifth of the potential pool of players for 2010 carries the HIV virus. That's a lot of people. And of course, that does something with uh, both the population and also the players. They're not there. They'd, some of them die, or there, are, there is violence, or other, uh, other, other diseases. The other thing they say is the lack of network, or the isolation. And I must say that I'm not, uh, I don't agree 100% uh, on this point, but they say a la lack of network or isolation from what's going on in the world might hinder you from um, from improving in sports. And they, use the ar they say that uh, most people don't have access to TV and stuff like that, and I, I'm not quite sure if that's correct anymore. My experience is that most people do or see what's going on in the rest of the world 
anyway. But uh, still, it's one of those reasons. And the last point, which is a quite opposition to this one, is disorganization. There are no functioning, or there are less functioning organizations than in the ones that are successful. And that's also why they might not be able to uh, improve as much. So they kill the myth, they bust the myth, but they also say that the key is practice. Yes, there are many people from poor childhoods that are playing uh, high in the high in the leagues, and that's because uh, they practice a lot. Uh, they might grow up in smaller apartments in Europe than, uh, and than, their, uh, than their friends, and they're, they have to be outside and practice, for instance. Of course, these are easy uh, explanations, and they are also generalizing, so, but still. What certainly helps is money and well-run organizations. And that's what we have, for instance, here in Norway and in the rest of Europe, most of the, the rest of Euro European countries. So this was just, um, I think it's an interesting article. And of course, we, um, we know a lot. We, we're going to see uh, later as well many, we're going to discuss, I mean, a lot of um, things with Norwegian sport that we might not be so proud of. And we can probably uh, uh, discuss whether Norway is as good as we want it to be. But still, it's an interesting perspective in the discussion. Now I'll give you a break. Next time we're going to talk about the sport club. Now we'll have a break. And uh, I think uh, because the film is one hour, so you take five, six, seven minutes, and then uh, you'd rather just go and have a coffee or something in the middle.